Okay, we are in 1 Corinthians. So if you want to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we are kind of midway through. And uh, we probably won't make it all the way through. I'm prepared to go all the way through, but um, I think we're kind of probably get about half of it in today and then the last half next week. Um, and then if you have your 1 Corinthians book, and you want to follow along in that as we go, we're going to start on page 22 there. First Corinthians to me has been so rich to this point. And I want to say, as we get started here, there are so many ladies on this Bible study that have such a rich and wealthy knowledge of rightly dividing the word. And um, I feel like one of them probably should be doing this because they have so much more seasoning in the word than I do. But I want to thank them as we get started for what they, they bring, their knowledge, their wealth, their um, Christ in them, that just that they bring that to this Bible study and we're all able to learn together. And that's what it's all about, that we are being knit together more and more as we study God's word together, and, and we grow together. We grow up, and that's just a blessing. As we've been in 1 Corinthians, you know, <clears throat> the first part of 1 Corinthians, Paul outlined for us a situation with them, and he wanted us to know, wanted them to know, first and foremost, that they are saved. Then he began to address some issues that they were having. And part of the issues was division among them. He mentions in chapter one, uh, in verse 12, now I say this, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. Now, when Paul did that, to, to put that in relationship to what we see today uh, would be divisions among churches, denominations. You know, we have a Baptist church here, we have a church of Christ here, we have a Catholic church over there, and we have a Pentecostal church there. There's just this host of denominations. And Paul poses the question to the Corinthians, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? So he, he calls this type of division out among the Corinthians, not only among them, but, but certainly uh doctrine here that we can glean from and learn from. I told you last week, and I kind of get confused whether I say this in the morning or I say this at night, but I shared one of those two times last week about a church that's kind of local to me, um, and they were one church, and then they had a disagreement, and so the, the ones who disagreed with this church split off, and they built a church right across the street, so this was a split. So this group of people said, I am of this church. And the people that went across the street then said, well, I am of this church. Well, we learned when we went through the book of Romans that we should not um, have these disagreements. And I attribute that type of thing to what Paul says in Romans is doubtful disputations. We have disputes and you know, petty little things that cause us to split. Well, that's what was happening here in the Corinthian church and or with the Corinthians period. Um, and then as we progressed on, Paul then continues his, um, his basically teaching of them, um, talking about in chapter two, um, I wanna make sure I say the right thing. verse 13 and 14, which things also we speak not in the world words which man's wisdom teaches. We did a thing against man's wisdom versus godly wisdom here. Uh, so which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. We talked a lot about that when we went through it. Verse 14 in chapter two, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually 
discerned. So we talked about that in the, in the context of the natural man. And sometimes we have expectations when we want somebody to get it, we want somebody to understand it so bad and we, they just can't understand it because they are still in the natural man. So they cannot receive the things of God. We talked a lot about that when we went over that scripture. Then in verse 16, for who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So we talked about that, the fleshly mind versus the mind of Christ. Last week, when we crossed over into chapter three, Paul starts out in chapter three by saying, uh, and I, brethren, could not speak to you unto, unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. When we first signed on, Lori came in with her grandson, Logan, and she had a bottle of milk because he is not able to receive meat just yet. But as he grows, he will be able to do that. The Corinthians at this point should have grown up enough that they were taking in some meat, sound doctrine of the word of God, but they were not able to do that. They were yet carnals, even as babies, unable to, to receive the meat. So as we kind of go forward in here, last week we ended in verse 9. And uh, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9 says this, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. We talked about that word husbandry. And what does it mean to be God's husbandry? And to be God's husbandry means basically God is the one doing the cultivating within us. God is, if you're talking about land, we're, we're approaching spring. March the 20th is the first day of spring. Well, I've already seen people plowing their field, uh, getting ready to plant. They're waiting for that last little cold snap before they actually put, put seed in the ground or plants in the ground but they've plowed the field. They're getting it ready. That's God in us. He is the one who does that. He's the one that tends his, um, his field and we are his field, so to speak. So he is the land worker. He is the farmer. That is what to be God's husbandry means. So ye are God's building. So we have verses 10 through 23 would take us to the end of this chapter, but I'm going to read verses 10 through 16, because when we get to verse 17, we're going to see a little bit of a shift there, and I don't want us to miss it, but what we're fixing to share in verses 10 through 16, as a, a newcomer a uh, few years back to write division, this was one of those big bolt cutters. You know, I felt like I was all bound up in it being about me. It was about my responsibility. I could have salvation today, but then tomorrow because of me, I would lose salvation. Well, this was that bolt cutter that cut that off and allowed me to understand how to stretch in the word of God and understand who I am. And that's what Paul is essentially trying to get the Corinthians to see as well, who they are. He outlined it for them in the first nine verses of the book, chapter one, verses one through nine, telling them who they were, who they are, um, that the testimony of Christ was confirmed in them. So he, he did that and he's continuing this, but they are living as babies. He's trying to, you know, you ever have somebody in your life, you just want to walk up to them and just shake them and say, would you please wake up? Would you please wake up? What are you doing? Where are you going? You know, um, we travel at various times in the year. And my husband is a, uh, a GPS person. He has to have the address plugged into the phone, GPS at all times. But then he argues with the phone and I'm telling him, okay, well, it told us to turn back there, but we didn't turn. So now it's rerouting us. You just want to say, where are you going to some people? Why aren't you listening to the GPS? We have it right here in the word of God. Why aren't we listening to it? Why aren't we putting it within us? 
And that's what we have to think about it. It is God's GPS for us. And it's so simple, and yet we complicate it. We make it hard. So I'm going to read verses 10 through 16, and then we'll kind of peel back those layers. So 1 Corinthians 3, beginning in verse 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Remember verse 9, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building, and then there in verse 16, know ye not that ye are the temple of God. God is building this, not me. It's not based on me. It's not based on what I do. I honestly don't even lay a brick. It's what he has done for me. And I believed it. I read and believed the word of God. That was my part. And past that, He's doing the bricklaying in my life. Christ in me is doing that. So when we talk about verse 10, going back up to verse 10, it talks about Paul calls himself a wise master builder. This is not Paul boasting about how smart he is, his own wisdom. You know, we've learned a lot about um, the wise and the foolish. We've learned a lot about the Greeks and the barbarians. The Greeks, by the way, are just educated Gentiles. The barbarians are uneducated Gentiles. So we've learned a lot about wise and unwise and how God says he's going to use the foolish things to confound the wise. We've talked a lot in this class about uh, the wisdom of the world, you know, the, the Nobel Prize winners. We've referred to them multiple times. Paul's not saying, look at me, I'm a wise master builder because I have done the work to be that, because I can now boast in myself to be that. That's not what he's saying at all. So he's not bragging about his wisdom. He said in 1 Corinthians 1 verses 18 and 19 that God has destroyed the wisdom of the wise with the preaching of the cross. And the preaching of the cross was deemed foolishness. Rather, Paul is talking about Christ in him. Remember verse nine, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. It's Christ in us, Christ in Paul, who is the wise master builder. We know this because he is a wise master builder according to, and he tells us this in verse 10, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me. So that is how we know He's not boasting about himself. He says, according to this grace, this is what I am. Galatians 6, 14 says, but God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. So Paul wouldn't say that later on in scripture and be boasting about his own wisdom here in 1 Corinthians. So Paul's ability like yours and mine, as a wise master builder is according to the grace of God, which is given unto him. Then in Ephesians 4, 7 says this, but unto every one of us, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Then again in Romans 12, 3, for I say, through the grace given unto me, 
to every man or to, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. So Paul is emphasizing here, he is a wise master builder according to the grace of God. Paul laid the foundations with the Corinthians by making absolutely sure that they believed the gospel in order to be saved. If you turn over probably back one, one page in my Bible, it's back one page, to 1 Corinthians 2 verse 2, Paul says to them, for I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He told them how to be edified in sound doctrine by reading and believing God's word. Now it is up to each member of the body of Christ. It's up to each and every one of us to allow Christ to be that builder, to be that bricklayer in us to allow Christ to build sound doctrine upon the gospel foundation within them. The only way we can do that is to read and believe God's word. So according to the grace of God, which is given unto me, Paul, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. We talked about foundations at one point, how important the strength of a foundation is. When you lay a foundation for a house, you have a form that you're going to pour concrete in. And within that form, you have what is called rebar going through. That is what builds the strength of your foundation. Well, the sound doctrine that Paul gives us is the strength of our foundation. And he says, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. So how we allow Christ to live in us matters. It absolutely matters. But verse 11 says, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ, okay? So when we have all this hitting us from different corners of our neighborhood, every corner has a different church. Every, you know, every community has a host. I don't even know how many denominations. You know, they it, now in today's society, they, they try to tell us that there are multiple genders. Well, we know there's two genders, male and female. Well, in society and churchianity, they also try to tell us there are multiple foundations for the word of God. There's no, there's no other but one. And that is confirmed here for other foundation can no man lay, but that, uh, then that is laid, which is, Christ, is Jesus Christ. So this foundation, this verse shows us that that foundation is the gospel. And remember that we just shared 1 Corinthians 2, 2, where he says, where Paul says to us that he uh, determined not to know anything among them uh, it, to save Jesus Christ and him crucified. So what he came was to impart that to them, lay that foundation. The foundation is Jesus Christ because in his blood, we are atoned for. Our sins are atoned by the blood of Christ. He makes our spirits and souls alive in Christ, and he gives us the Holy Ghost by which we can understand God's word. Apart from that, what did we read a couple of weeks back in 1 Corinthians 2, 14? But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. So apart from that, we cannot know or understand God's word. Without Christ's work, we are still dead in our trespasses and sins. And I want to share that scripture with you, Ephesians 2, verse 1, because there's a, there's a word that needs to be highlighted here. Ephesians 2, verse 1 says, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, when we are on this side of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we believe the gospel of Christ, then we are, number one, quickened. It says he hath quickened who were dead. So now we are no longer dead, but we are made alive in Christ. And we have that gift of the Holy Spirit. 
uh, so that we can understand the things of God. Now, what we do with them is a totally different story, and we're going to get into that in just a few minutes. So the capacity to build a spiritual building in Christ, if we don't believe, is not there. But if we do believe, then we have, we are quickened. We have been made a lie. We are no longer dead in our sins and trespasses. And Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of the Lord's holy temple within you, within me. So verses 12 through 14, I have a lot of people that, that um, do not understand in my personal life, do not understand this because like me have been brought up in legalistic churches um, and I'll never forget when our three ladies gave their testimonies, what I took away from each one of them. And one of them, Lori, was she said, it's not God. Christ didn't say on the cross, I've done my part. Now you do yours. Christ didn't say that. He said it is finished. Well, when we understand that and then we put this scripture with it, then we are totally set free from the bondage of legalism over our salvation. We don't have to question it. We don't have to perform for it. We don't have to think, oh, Lord, you know, please forgive me because I thought this or I did that or I said this. We don't have to do that. This was a, like I said, that bolt cutter that, that is freeing for the chains that, that shackle us to a legalistic lifestyle in churchianity. So verses 12 through 14. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, what is the foundation? Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. If any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it. So if any man builds on this foundation, gold, silver, and precious stones, gold, silver, and precious stones are purified by fire. Regarding Israel, God says that he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. That's in Malachi 3, verse 3. Therefore, the works of gold, silver, and precious stones are the works that are rewarded by Jesus Christ, because they survived the fire. That would be the work of the spirit in your life, in my life. And the fire will burn out any impurities there uh, of our sin being purged out from them. Now, these, this section of scripture is actually talking about the judgment seat of Christ. So the second part of that scripture, where it talks about wood, hay, and stubble, these are those things that we build upon in the flesh. These are those things that will not survive a fire. If I put, I want to start a fire in my backyard, well, I'm going to put, you know, I'm going to stack it with wood and I'm going to have some fire starter in there. That's the wood, hay, stubble. That's the flesh. It represents our flesh. Wood, hay, and stubble are things that burn up in a fire. These things are destroyed. That would be the purging. And so they must be the works of the flesh. So in that scripture, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, we have the work of the spirit and the work of the flesh. And what does verse 13 say that will happen to that? Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day. What is the day? The day is, is judgment. The day is the, the day of the judgment seat of Christ. The day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So whether I have allowed Christ to live in me, whether I have read and believed the word of God and allowed the master builder in me to be the bricklayer, to build the temple of God with that is me, then that would be that works in, in the spirit, allowing the spirit to live through me. Um, and the wood, hay, and stubble would be, I'm going to give you an example. 
on Thursday nights, we're in a section of scripture in Romans that's very hard. It's, it's talking about um, the downward spiral of, of sin. And when it talks about those down, that downward spiral, it's all sexual sin. And it's talking about uh, where, um, well, let me just go over there. First, uh, Romans 1, verses 24 and following. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 26, for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. And then verse 28 kind of culminates that thought. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Now, these, this section of scripture talks about a downward spiral of sin, and it uses sexual sin because the sexual sin is the sin that happens against your own body. And so there is a progressive downward spiral. This is talking about an unbeliever, that downward spiral of sin to an unbeliever. Well, now we're talking about gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. How does, how does that work with someone that we see in the, with the natural eye that's seemingly cultivating that downward spiral of sin in their life? What does that mean when this scripture here, you cannot cancel the scripture with the scripture. You can only expound scripture with scripture. So nothing, God is not a God that he would contradict himself, and he's not a God that he would lie. So what does that mean when it says, um, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it, all of that that we just read? What does that mean? If you have, and I'm going to use a sexual sin just to illustrate this point. If you have a believer in Christ that has believed the gospel, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ as the atonement for their sin, and then they go on to, maybe they begin the journey of learning, letting, reading and believing God's word, that sound doctrine can be built up, but say they divert, they go back to that, that sinful lifestyle. And in Romans, it's a progressive nature of lifestyle where at one point it's same sex relations. Then at the other point, it's, I mean, it's opposite sex relations. And then at the other point, it's same sex relations. And then we graduate to the reprobate mind. What about somebody like that? What about somebody who is a saved person and yet they're living this lifestyle? That's a very difficult place to be. And hopefully, hopefully our relationship one with another can come alongside somebody in love and show them the sound doctrine that comes from the word of God. But that lifestyle is wood, hay, and stubble. Wood, hay, stubble. So when that is put in the fire, what happens to wood, hay, and stubble? It burns up. It turns to ash. It's good for nothing. You sweep it up and you throw it in the trash or at least that's what I do. So when you have that in a lifestyle of a saved person, let's read on to see what happens. So verse 13, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort is it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. So my reward is based upon the, the gold, silver, and precious stones, because that's what is purified by the fire. It's not based upon the wood, hay, stubble, my flesh, because at that point, my flesh is not going to be, it's going to be burned up. So 
the day shall we re declare it. I'm on page um, 23 in your book, a couple of paragraphs down. The day shall declare it refers to the judgment seat of Christ. Second Corinthians 5.10 says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now the good would be gold, silver, precious stones, the things of the spirit. The bad would be wood, hay, stubble, the things of the flesh. All believers appear before the judgment seat of Christ after the rapture takes place because all believers if they've believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ, they have salvation. It's not going to be taken from them. So they will appear whether they've continued to live the flesh life or they've continued to allow the spirit to live through them. They will appear before the judgment seat of Christ after the rapture. And this is the place where we receive our reward. And what is the reward? I never knew this. I never, ever knew this. It's a throne, principality, power, might, dominion, or every name that is named. Now, we can read those rewards in Ephesians 1.21 and Colossians 1.16, and those, those scriptures are referenced for you here in this commentary. Halfway through the tribulation period, Satan and his forces are kicked out of their positions in heavenly places. That's in Revelation 12, 7 through 9. So right now, who is occupying these thrones, these uh, principalities, powers, mights, and dominions? It's not the body of Christ. It is Satan and his forces. And halfway through the tribulation, they're going to be kicked out of those heavenly places. And we, you and I, will take the places that we were rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, we just read that our reward is based on that gold, silver, and precious stones. That's based on the spirit. Wood, hay, and stubble is based on the flesh. So what happens when you have somebody that stands there at the judgment seat of Christ, and this is burned up? And that was my question to Eric long ago. And he explained it to me that that is where that person is counted in every name that is named. Paul wants these Corinthians, just like he wants you and I, to understand that these rewards, if we want to continue taking in milk as a newborn baby, we don't want to, you know, grow up in Christ, allow Christ to live in us we're really ineffective. We're not, we're not um, earning rewards. And I hate to use that word, and it's probably not a good word, earning, but our reward is based upon our ability to let Christ live in us. That gold, silver, and precious stones, not sowing our life to our flesh. So when works are mentioned, most people think of working at the soup kitchen or volunteering at the nursing home, um, helping a little old lady across the street. But this is not what works are about. Jesus said in Mark 7, verse 20, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. God said to apostate Israel, I hate. That's a big word. Four letters, but a big word. I hate. I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. That's Amos 5.21. That was because Israel was doing the works of the law according to the flesh, but their heart was far from God. Jeremiah 17.10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. So basically what the motivation of our hearts is what's important here. The work that is tried at the judgment seat of Christ is the motivation of our heart. If we build sound doctrine by reading and believing God's word, 
We build the sound doctrine in our inner man and make decisions based on that sound doctrine. First of all, we have to know what is the sound doctrine to us today. And that's Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon. But if we make decisions based upon that sound doctrine, we build up gold, silver, and precious stones, regardless of what it looks like. If it looks good in the flesh, well, great. But if it doesn't, it doesn't matter. If we are using the mind of Christ, which we talked a lot about in the recent past, the mind of Christ, using the sound doctrine that we learned from Paul's epistles to make decisions, we are building or, or taking heed to what material we're building with. He says here, um, In verse 10, but let every man at the end of verse 10 in 1 Corinthians 3, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. When we are building using the sound doctrine that comes from Paul's epistles in the word of God, that's taking heed. That's paying attention to our building material. Um, and it comes from the motivation of our heart. Therefore, when the fire tries every man's work of what sort it is, ultimately the work is doctrine. If I have sound doctrine in my inner man, my work will survive the fire. That's the whole point. And I will receive a reward of a heavenly position or a, a position in heavenly places. If I never build up the sound doctrine in my inner man, I have nothing but fleshly works, which will all be burned up at the judgment seat of Christ right here, even if I did things that appeared to be good to man. And let me talk to, to you about what those could be. Go to church every Sunday. Volunteer at the church on the work days. This shows then how critical it is for us to read and believe God's word and make decisions based upon the sound doctrine that the Holy Ghost teaches us. Otherwise, our motivation will be nothing but our flesh. And we will suffer loss of our reward. Why? Because no flesh is justified by the law. No flesh is justified by the law. Galatians 2.16 says this, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So when we are here in scripture, we need to realize when it's talking about the gold, silver, and precious stones, that's works of the spirit. That's me allowing the sound doctrine to take root in my life. That's exercising the mind of Christ and using the mind of Christ to make decisions. Remember what chapter 2 verse 16 says, for who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. We have to exercise that mind. We have to fill it up with something, which is the sound doctrine that comes from the word of God. So when I use that, I'm building gold, silver, and precious stones. Um, but if I build with my flesh, it will I will suffer loss. That's the wood, hay, and stubble. And what he says here in verse 14, I'm going to share that again. If any man's work abide, if it remain, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Now, verse 15, very important scripture for you and I. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. It doesn't say he shall be lost. It says he shall suffer loss colon. My Bible has a colon after that word loss. So I'm fixing to expound on what does suffering loss mean, but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. So this is a great verse to teach eternal security of the believer because it says that we do not lose our salvation, even if our works are entirely carnal. Remember Paul's motivation so far in this first Corinthians is to show the Corinthians that they're living in the flesh. 
They're making decisions not based on the mind of Christ. They're not building with gold, silver, and precious stones, but wood, hay, and stubble. This is his whole point. And fortunately, it's pinned for us by inspiration of the Holy Spirit that we can learn from it too. So, but it doesn't say we shall lose our salvation. It says we shall suffer loss. In Daniel chapter three, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, you may, you may understand them or recognize those names if we give them their other name, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were thrown into a fiery furnace. Daniel 3, 27 says that the fire had no power upon their bodies. They did not even have the smell of fire on them. Why? Because the son of God was in that fire with them, protecting them from harm. Now, similarly, Jesus Christ's soul went to hell. Now, I think I wrote these down because these were good points to, to um, illustrate. Psalm 1610, Jesus went to hell. Do we even sometimes realize that? I don't think we do. I know I really didn't, not when I was in the world of churchianity. I did not understand that until coming into right division. But Psalm 16, 10 says, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither will thou suffer thy holy one, Jesus Christ, to see corruption. So Jesus Christ's soul went to hell, taking the punishment of our sin upon him, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he hath made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ fully paid for our sins in hell, he won the victory over death for us. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the glory, I mean, the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The strength of sin is the law. But you and I are no longer under the law, but under grace. So Jesus Christ paid for our sins in hell. He won the victory over death for us. He took the keys of hell and of death with him. Revelation 1.18 I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. We are now accepted in the beloved. Ephesians 1, 6 says, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us, he hath made us, present tense, accepted in the beloved who is Christ. We are accepted in the beloved, who is Christ, and our lives are hid with Christ in God. Colossians 3, 3. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. At the judgment seat of Christ, our souls go through the fire. We just read that account here in 1 Corinthians 3. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. So our souls go through that fire to make sure there is no unholiness in us since God is holy. All sinful impurities on us are purged out that wood, hay, and stubble. All of that is purged out and our bodies are not harmed. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They were in the fiery furnace. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. I like those names better. But they were in that fiery furnace, yet they, they came out of it without even the smell of fire. Why? If we were to put it to this scripture, it was because of gold, silver, and precious stones. Because if they had been nothing but wood, hay, and stubble, without 
the Lord Jesus protecting them, the Lord God, they would have been burned up, but they came out without harm, without even the stench of fire because, and, and that is how we will be on that day. Our bodies will not be harmed whatsoever by that fire. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool to think about? Because we are in Christ and he is pure. Christ saves our souls, just like he saved Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And this is confirmed by 2 Timothy 2.13, which says this, and this is another scripture so vital and so good to compare spiritual things with spiritual right here in this particular scripture, 2 Timothy 2.13, which says, if we believe not, remember the example that I gave about the sexual, the downward spiral there of sexual sin and the homosexual who just believed the gospel, but continued to sow that lifestyle, did not fill up with God's word, the sound doctrine, which by the way, gives us victory over that sin. What does the word say? For sin shall not have dominion over you. But yet the second Timothy 2.13 says, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. I'm nowhere in there. It's not talking about me. It says he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. In other words, if we follow our flesh after we are saved, the Lord Jesus will still give us eternal life in heaven. That is such a hard concept because it's not what we're taught in the world. It's not what we're taught in the world. I don't care if you went to church every time the doors were open. And I was one of those who thought, okay, here it is. It's church time. I got to be there. I really don't feel like going tonight, but I'm going to go because, and that was back in the day where it was Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and anytime else they decided to have something. But those were our three designated times. And it was so important that you be there every single time but I didn't learn this there. I learned that it was about how good I was, that Jesus did it. He did his part. Now it's up to me to do mine. And my part was more than reading and believing God's word and believing his gospel. But that's not the truth of God's word. It's just not. And Christ would have to deny himself if he robbed me or stripped away from me the eternal life that he promised me. I am now hidden with Christ in God. I did the example of holding my hand up with my other hand. You see these fingers, but when I put them behind here, you don't see these fingers anymore. It doesn't mean they're not there because they're still there, but that's Christ. When we are in Christ, our life is now hidden with Christ in God. Our life is still here. We can still sow in the flesh if we want to. And we have that decision to make every day. Paul would say, I crucify myself daily. I die daily is what he says. I die daily. Well, we have to do that too. But even if we don't, this is where we are. Still here but our life is now hidden with Christ in God. And that is our seal. That is the barrier that keeps the fire from burning us. That is the barrier. So since Christ cannot deny himself, 2 Timothy 2.13, all believers are saved by fire, even if they receive a loss of their reward. And that is what that loss in, in um, verse 15 is talking about, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, loss of reward, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Do you know people who need to know that? Do you know people that right now are so burdened down because they think they're not good enough, because they think God would never love them because of what they've done? or it's too late for them. Understanding these passages of scripture is the key to setting people free from that mindset 
that mentality and realizing who they are in Christ if they've believed the gospel. So verse 16 says, know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you? When Solomon built the temple, he prayed to the Lord, but will God indeed dwell on earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I have built it. That's in 1 Kings 8, 27. Solomon acknowledged that sinful man cannot build a house for God to dwell in. God says the same thing in Isaiah 66, 1. The heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? The place of God's rest is built by the branch, the Lord Jesus Christ. Behold, the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord. The way he did this for us today was by creating a clean temple within believing man for God to dwell in. Remember up in verse nine, for we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. He's the one doing the building. I, I can't because all of my righteousnesses, we learned this about Israel, all of their righteousnesses were considered as filthy rags. That's me. All of my righteousnesses are nothing but filthy rags. And will my righteousnesses will be burned up as wood, hay, and stubble. The only thing that will remain are, are the things that Christ did in me and through me, the motivation of my heart. The body of Christ, both collectively and individually, you and I, we are God's temple. Ephesians 2.22 says that the body of Christ is builded together for a habitation of God through the spirit. And that's what makes this verse 16 true. We are builded together for an habitation of God through the spirit. And Paul tells us, as well as the Corinthians, know ye not that ye are the temple of God? and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. So there's another correlation there that he's talking to saved people, regardless of the fact that they are in carnality, they are in their flesh. Because remember chapter two, verse 14, and, and we've said it several times today, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God. Well, here in verse 16 in chapter three, he says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you? So if they were still unsaved, he would not have said that because the natural cannot, the natural man cannot receive the things of the spirit of God, let alone have the spirit of God dwell in him. So these are saved people. We need to remember that when we are talking with our friends and our loved ones. And, and try, you know, as much as we want to go and shake them, what are you doing? That type of thing. Remember that if they've believed the gospel, they are saved. They may not have sound doctrine, and we are growing up into sound doctrine. Paul told, told us in Romans 1, he longed to see them. He longed to come to them, to impart some spiritual gift to the end that they may be established. And that's what he's doing. I love the fact that I'm doing 1 Corinthians on Thursday morning and then Romans again on Thursday night because I can't tell you what it has done to me for me to open up both of those books together and understand why was it important for us to do Romans first and then how we've grown into 1 Corinthians and now I'm able to understand some of the things in 1 Corinthians based on what I learned in Romans. It's just amazing how God did this, how he preserved his word that you and I could grow up 
in it. Have it built up brick by brick in our inner man. Why? So that when we get here to 1 Corinthians 3, at the judgment seat of Christ, where Paul is talking about that, that the foundation that is laid is that of Jesus Christ, that we take heed to those things in which we use to build and that progressive nature of what, what happens when we build continuously in the flesh versus in the spirit. And then culminating to where we are right now, know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. I'm going to read, I told you that here we would, we would have a shift, and there is a little bit of a shift. I'm going to touch on it briefly. I'm going to read the last part of the chapter, but we are not going to, going to dive into this until next week, but 1 Corinthians 3, verses 17 through 23, and you will, you will, hopefully you'll be able to pick out the shift. I'm sure you will. Verse 17, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Verse 20, and again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And ye are Christ's and Christ is God's. I love the way the shift there is in verse 17. If any man defile him, the temple of God, him shall God destroy. There's a lot of people, a lot of church, a lot of religion and religious systems that use that to show that a believer can, can lose his salvation. But when we peel that back next week, we're going to realize that in the context that this comes, um, we can't lose our salvation. What did we say? Um, verse 15 said, if a man's, any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Does not say suffer loss of salvation. So when we want to shift from verse 15 to verse 17 and bind that as a salvation issue, that's not what that's talking about. So that's where that shift comes. And so next week, as we open up verse 17 through 23, and the end of that, this chapter, and ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's, all of this compiled together, building upon what Paul is teaching here is important. And it's important that we understand it clearly so that we don't walk up to our family member or our friend and just shake them, that we're able to expound the word of God in love to them to hopefully at some point bring freedom to the thought process that it is about them and it's up to them. It's not about them and it's not up to them. Remember 1 Corinthians is written to saved people who have taken the pendulum and swung it all the way over to one side and are not letting Christ live in them. They are not learning sound doctrine. They are not reading and believing God's word. And Paul is bringing all of this to bring them back to the place of allowing Christ to live in them, to use and exercise the mind of Christ when they make decisions. And to this point has culminated into the reward versus loss of reward. And, you know, when I was growing up, I had the idea. And maybe some of you did too, but I had the idea that as long as I went to church, I was a good moral person. I didn't, you know, disobey or rebel against the rules of my parents. I didn't do all of that. I was a good person. I was the good girl. Remember a long time ago, I used that good girl 
theology or that mentality. It's hard for a good girl to realize she's a sinner. I was that. It was hard for me to realize that I was a sinner. Um, so, but I was taught, or at least in my mind, what I perceived of the word of God and of heaven and hell was as long as I was that good girl, I would go to heaven and that was the end of the story. Oh, not that we died, we would live eternally in heavenly places with God. I did not understand the heavenly kingdom versus the earthly kingdom, those two realms. I did not know anything about what a reward was. I thought heaven was the reward. I didn't realize that the sound doctrine that the word teaches me is about rewards of thrones, principalities, powers, mights, and dominions. I didn't know any of that. So the reason Paul is illustrating this for them is because they don't know that either. Because they're sowing their life in the flesh, not allowing God to do the building. And we're going to get more and more into that. So 1 Corinthians, we're in the flesh, we're in the carnality. And then when we get to 2 Corinthians, we're going to be more into the legalism. We overcorrect and or the Corinthians overcorrected. For you and I, we, we have it in black and white in front of us to learn and to glean from it and to harvest what has been planted here in the in the form of sound doctrine for us to live our lives now i've tried to now i don't know if you, you guys have noticed this or not but i've tried to shorten our thursday morning just a slight bit um because i didn't want us to get so bogged down in going you know way over because i i can talk and i have it prepared to the end of the chapter but I don't, want to, I don't want us to get into that part that needs to be kept in a context. So I am going to stop here. And I realize it's a little bit early, but I am going to stop here so that next week we can put the, the end cap on chapter three in the context that it is, because it's an important chapter for us. Um, so let's stop here. Father, we thank you for this day, we thank you for the gathering that we have together with friends and sisters in Christ. Father, we thank you most of all for your word, that it is the truth, that within it contains the sound doctrine in which we can be rooted. Father, we thank you that we are your husbandry. Father, that you are the one who does the building in us. It's not up to me. It's not up to my volunteerism or my performance or my good girl status. It's not up to that. What I have to do is just let you do the building, let you do the work in me. And Father, I thank you for that. I thank you for the freedom that comes when I understand that because of my flesh, I don't lose my salvation. Father, but when you said it is finished, you meant it. You meant it. Father, I do pray that each and every one of us will be built up in our inner man. Father, that we will have understanding of the scriptures and more so as we read and believe and read and believe and read and believe. Father, thank you for the Holy Spirit, that which is in us and that which inspired the writing of your word. We thank you, Father, for these things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.